In the world of the arts, the remarkable fact has very often been noted that what we still think of as modern painting and modern music and modern poetry and the modern novel all developed, roughly speaking, simultaneously. They all got going in the early years of this century and first became fashionable in about the 1920s. And in all the arts, modernism has had some strikingly similar consequences. For instance, in each of the arts, there was a turning away from the unself-conscious depiction of the world or of experience and a turning in on itself. Art actually became its own subject matter. That's to say, it became familiar for, say, the subject of a poem to be the process of writing a poem or the difficulties of being a poet. Ditto with plays and novels and later even films. Music and painting, too, in their different ways, exhibited the same concern with their own innards and very often turned them into their own subject matter and put them on display. In all the arts, too, and perhaps this is related to the last point, there was a disintegration of traditional forms, a tendency to build new structures and to build them out of small, carefully shaped fragments. I'm emphasizing this because all this is true, and with remarkable exactitude, of philosophy as well, a fact which illustrates how deeply embedded the development of philosophy is in the cultural matrix of its time. Modern philosophy can be said to have started in 1903 with the breakaway of G.E. Moore and Bertrand Russell from the idealism which had dominated the 19th century. And then, after the pioneering work of Russell, followed by that of Wittgenstein, who was a pupil of Russell, there developed in the 1920s in Austria the first fully-fledged school devoted to the new philosophy, a school which was known as the Vienna Circle. To the philosophy they developed, they gave the name Logical Positivism, and for a long time afterwards, that label was attached to modern philosophy generally in the minds of very many laymen. The person who introduced logical positivism into England was A.J. Eyre, and his is the name that has been chiefly associated with it ever since in this country. He did so in a still very famous and widely read book called Language, Truth and Logic, which he published in January 1936 when he was only 25. It's very much a young man's book, explosively written and it's still the best short guide to the central doctrines of logical positivism. The aggressiveness of that book was typical of the movement as a whole. They self-consciously organized themselves like a political party, with regular meetings and publications and international congresses, and they propagated their doctrines with missionary zeal. If we look at the question of what they were fighting against so passionately and why, I think that will provide us with the clearest starting point for our consideration of logical positivism. Then we'll be in a better position to go on and examine their own doctrines. Professor Eyre, what was it that the logical positivists were campaigning so passionately against? Well, primarily they were against <coughs> metaphysics, what they call metaphysics, and that was any suggestion that there might be a world going beyond the ordinary world of science and common sense, the world revealed to us by our senses. Already Kant, at the end of the 18th century, had said it was impossible to have any knowledge of anything that wasn't within the realm of possible sense experience. But these Viennese people went further. They said that any statement that wasn't either a formal statement, like a statement of logic or mathematics, or one that was empirical te empirically testable, was simply nonsensical. And so they cut away, therefore, all metaphysics in that sense. And this had some further implications. It was, for example, obviously a condemnation of any theology, any, any notion of there being a transcendent God. And this, although they were themselves not politically conscious, conscious, with one exception, there was one of them who was, but only one, a man called Otto Neurath, had political implications, because there was in Vienna at that time a rather bitter struggle between the socialists and a right-wing clerical party headed by, by Dolphus, and the opposition of the Vienna Circle of Metaphysics was in part a political act, even though they weren't themselves primarily concerned with politics. Now, you mentioned one of them by name, Otto Neurath. Yes. Since we're going to be talking about this circle of people, I think it'll be helpful if we get clear who the main individuals were. Who were they? Well, the chief person, the leader of the circle, the official leader of the circle, was a man called Moritz Schlick, who was uh, uh, originally a German, and he came to Vienna at the age uh, of about 40, um, in the early 1920s, in his, in his early 40s. And he had, like most of them, or many of them, had been trained originally as a physicist and was interested mainly in the philosophy of physics. And in fact, one of the leading uh, traits of the circle is the extreme reverence for uh, natural, natural sciences. And uh, Schlick was their chairman, and he um, 
took up his chair in the middle 20s and started organising the circle, I think, almost from the moment he arrived there. Then the next most important person was another German called Rudolf Carnap, and he had been a pupil of the great German logician Frege. He'd been a pupil of Frege in, in Jena, and he came to Vienna a few years after Schlick in the late 1920s, and in fact left Vienna in the early 30s for Prague, but was, sti was still a very powerful influence in the movement. He was the chief contributor to their journal, which was a journal called Erkenntnis. The third person was a man I've already mentioned called Neurath. I think he was an Austrian, you know, most, uh, but he was the most active of them politically, and in fact did have some post in the revolutionary Spartacist government in Munich after the First World War. And he was very nearly a Marxist. He wanted to combine, combine Parsonism and Marxism, and it was he who was mainly conscious of it as a political movement. He wanted to organize it politically. And it's obvious from what you said that this was a, a radically uh, uh, revolutionary movement. I mean, they were destructive of established ideas in religion, destructive of established ideas in politics, and above mm -hmm. all, destructive of established ideas in the German philosophical tradition. And I suppose that the two main uh, scalpels that they yes. used to tear away what they mm -hmm. regarded as all that diseased or dead intellectual tissue were logic and science, hence the name logical positivism. Indeed. Uh, it wasn't quite so novel as all that. It was continuing an, an old, uh, 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 previous Viennese tradition. There was a scientist and, and philosopher of science called Ernst Mach. He's the man against whom Lenin wrote his materialism and imperial criticism who flourished in Vienna at the end of the 19th century. He was a professor in Prague from about the 1860s onwards, then came to Vienna. And it was he who took the view of science that, for example, Schlick also took, that it must deal, in, in the last resort, simply with human sensations. Since our, all, our knowledge of scientific facts comes through our senses, then Mach reasoned that in the last resort, science must simply be a description of sensation. And this was the, the Viennese people took over. And, of course, they were following an old empiricist uh, tradition. Although they didn't themselves know, know or care much about the history of philosophy, what they said was very like what was said by the English philosopher, uh, Scottish philosopher, David Hume, in the 18th century. To that extent, they weren't all that novel. They weren't all that revolutionary. What was revolutionary was, in a sense, their, their fervor, and their seeing this as putting philosophy on a new road. They thought that here at last we've now discovered what philosophy is going to be. It's going to be the handmaiden of science. It wasn't so much that they used science in their philosophy as that they thought that the whole field of knowledge was taken up by science. I mean, science describes the world. The only world there is is this world, the world of things around us and so on, and this is what science describes. And there isn't any other domain for philosophy to occupy itself with. Therefore, what can it do? All it can do is analyze and criticize the theories, the concepts of science. This is how science came in. Logic came in as supplying them with a tool. Logic had remained pretty much stagnant uh, since the days of Aristotle. And then at the beginning of the 19th century, it took a move forward. There were some uh, precursors. There was Boole and De Morgan. But the real jump came at the end of the 19th century with Frege in Germany and, as we ourselves said earlier, Russell and Whitehead in, in, uh, in England. And this um, generalized logic more widely than had been done. They didn't actually refute Aristotle. They showed that Aristotle's work was this little corner of logic, but they had lived there a much more a uh, wide-reaching, far-ranging logic, which provided them with a very powerful tool of analysis. It enabled them to express things much more precisely. And since they were very interested uh, in structure, since they thought that science was largely concerned with structure, with relations between things, the uh, development by, originally by uh, Schroeder and Peirce in the 19th century, and by Russell and Whitehead in the 20th century, of logical relations gave them a tool. It gave them a tool of philosophical analysis. While I entirely take your point about Mach being a precursor of, mm -hmm. uh, of the logical positivist movement, it is true, isn't it, that in addition to there being a new logic mm -hmm. at the turn of the century, there was also a new science. I mean, dramatically personified above all by Einstein. Yes. But there was this enormous breakthrough, uh, a, a, a yes. thought system of ideas which had started with Newton and which had been accepted as incorrigible fact by most of the Western mm -hmm. world for nearly 300 years. This was beginning to break down, break down under the mm -hmm. influence of Einstein and the new physics, and surely that must have had an enormous uh, impact on what well, they well, were doing. This had a very impor important, uh, a very important stimulus to them, because, yeah. uh, in fact, Einstein had been uh, uh, affected by Mark. Uh, I, I heard it from his own mouth that <laughs> he owed a great deal to, uh, uh, to Mark. And they saw Einstein's work in theory of relativity, and also they saw the new quantum theory as a vindication of their approach. 
because what um, Einstein had done, and anyhow as they interpreted him, was to say there's no, you can't attach any sense to uh, something like simultaneity unless you consider how statements about simultaneity are verified. That is to say that what, what, what is meant by talking of things being, being uh, uh, simultaneous depends upon how simultaneity is actually determined in observation. And they saw this as a great vindication within science of their, of their philosophical approach. Similarly with quantum theory, I mean, the fact that, that uh, quantum, in quantum theory no meaning is attached to a particle simultaneously having a precise velocity and a precise position because this can't be tested, because if you measure the velocity, it distorts the position. If you measure the position, it distorts the velocity. Therefore, the scientists attached to the meaning. They said, this is a proof that what, is, what, what, what scientific concept, concepts mean is determined by how they're verified. And this is what we're saying. And so this gave them an enormous stimulus. They said, well, science is on our side. We're interpreting science properly. And, uh, and they were, as I said. Carnap and, and, and Schlick were originally physicists. Narak was a sociologist. So in other words, now we're getting at, at, at what the revolutionary nature of their work consisted yes, in, yes. that they were applying the new logic and the new science yes. to traditional methods of thought yes. and breaking these methods down, as it were, under the impact of the, uh, of the new methods. Is that so? Well, they w yes, what they wanted to say was that the old philosophical problems were either senseless or else capable of being solved by purely logical techniques. Now, what were the doctrines, the main doctrines that they developed uh, in the course of doing this? Well, uh, there were three, really. Uh, the first, the, the, everything hinged on the so-called principle of verifiability, uh, which was put succinctly by uh, Schlick as the meaning of the proposition is its method of verification. And this is uh, slightly vague as it's there expressed, and we've labored ever since <laughs> some hours to make it precise, and never wholly, wholly successfully. But it had two consequences. One was that anything that couldn't be empirically verified, verified by sense observation, was meaningless. I've already referred to this. And secondly, it was interpreted uh, by Schlich, uh, later it got loosened, but in the early days by Schlich, as entailing that what a, hypo what a proposition meant uh, could be uh, um, described could be, uh, uh, by saying what would verify it. And so you get a reduction of all statements to statements about uh, statements of immediate observation. This was the first point, which had both negative and a positive side. Negative as excluding metaphysics, positive as showing a way of anal analyzing uh, what sort of statements that were significant. Then they held, this they um, got partly from Wittgenstein, but, I, but there is evidence that Schlick held this, discovered this on his own, that the propositions of logic and mathematics, necessarily true statements, were what Wittgenstein called tautologies. They, they said the same thing over again, as it were. I mean, they were... They merely unpacked the content unpacked of the what content, was already... Yes. They're like saying all, all, all bachelors are unmarried men, or all brothers are male. Mm -hmm. But all logical mathematics simply was uh, what Kant had called analytic, that is to say, un as, you, as you put it, unpacking the content of what you've already mm -hmm. said. And then the third main thing was about philosophy itself. They thought that philosophy must consist in what Wittgenstein and Schlick called an activity of elucida elucidation. I mean, I think there, is a, there was a saying of Wittgenstein, which was quoted again by Schlick, that philosophy is not a doctrine, but an activity. It, does, it doesn't issue in a body of true or false propositions, because it's covered by the sciences, but simply is the activity of clarifying, analyzing, uh, and in certain cases, uh, uh, exposing nonsense. I mean, Wittgenstein, at the end of his famous book, The Tractatus, had said, the right method of philosophy is simply to wait till somebody says something about physical, then show him it is nonsense. Which is a bit, of course, negative and discouraging yeah, for well. a philosopher. But now, taking off the first of those three points first, yes. um, I think it, 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 it'll be fairly clear to most people yes. uh, what's meant by the view that any statement about the world must make some observable difference to yes. something if it's true. Yes. Otherwise, it's difficult to see what, how it can have any application. Yes. Yes. When you say that the meaning of a statement uh, consists in the method yes. by which you'd verify it. I think that's probably not clear to some of the people who are listening to this discussion. What can you explain that a bit? Yes, I can. Um, originally, it was thought by Schick and by um, Mach before him, and possibly also by Wittgenstein, though it's not quite clear what Wittgenstein's atomic elementary statements were meant to be, that you could translate out all statements into statements about uh, sense data, sense about, about immediate data of observation. And uh, this was never actually achieved, 
and clearly runs in, into um, very great difficulties, for instance, in the case of uh, universal propositions, propositions saying all ravens are black. I mean, all gases expand when heated because the range uh, covered by the all might be infinite. And of course, if it's infinite, then you couldn't possibly translate out. And so um, they then were driven to rather desperate expedients. Slick actually said that, 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 that statements of this kind weren't propositions at all, but rules, simply rules from getting to, from one particular statement, this raven is black, and, I mean, this is a raven, to, to, this is black and so on, rules of inference. And then there were other difficulties. I mean, clearly, it seems perfectly clear that if, if you take very high-level, abstract scientific propositions about uh, atoms and electrons, nuclei, and so on, to try and write this out in terms of sensations, in terms of blues and, and rounds and warm feelings of warmth and so on, it simply doesn't work. And for various reasons, then, the principle got weakened, and it was uh, the idea that you, you could translate out that became given up, and all it was required was that, that these uh, propositions to be significant should be uh, confirmable by, by uh, sense uh, observation. And this meant that their meaning remained sort of partially undetermined. Mm. That, that it was thought that, that, that uh, I mean, they uh, got meaning from the cases where they were, in fact, con uh, confirmed, where, where, the, where the test could be carried out, and the rest was left rather vague. Also, this original view less led to very implausible views, for example, about the past, because statements about the past were equated with the evidence we could now get for them. So saying Caesar crossed the Rubicon was what actually to mean if I look up in the sort of history book, I will see it written, or if I go and dig, I will find such and such, such, and such uh, relics and so on. And I actually, I actually put forward this view in languages, languages and logic. It now seems desperately and implausible to me. <laughs> And again, there's a difference about other minds, of course. If yeah. I say that you're feeling such and such, I can only observe your behavior. And, and in the early days, the genies wanted to say that all those statements meant was statements about people's behavior. That again became doubted. So I think that the verification principle in its strong form really didn't last very long. Let me just, we are covering a lot of ground very fast. Let, yes, let, me, let me recapitulate yes. uh, just to make sure that we've got things absolutely clear up yes. to this point. According to the, what we might call the strong version mm. of logical positivism, all meaningful statements yes. were of two kinds. Yes. Uh, if, either they were empirical statements about the world, yes. in which case they must make some observable difference to something yes. and therefore must be verifiable yes. if they're to be meaningful. That's right. It doesn't mean to say they're necessarily true, because we might go no, and try and verify false, them and find that they're not true. Certainly, certainly. But they, it must be possible for them to be yes, true yes, and yes. therefore possible for them to be verified yes, yes. if they're to have any mm. meaning. That's one lot of statements, empirical statements. Yes. Or they must be about mathematics or logic, yes. in which case they are purely self-referential. Uh, the true ones uh, unpack what is already in, in the yes. premises. I, I, the false ones are self-contradictions. Mm -hmm. Is right. And if a statement is of neither of these two kinds, then it's meaningless. That's right. And with that as a kind of weapon, mm -hmm. they were able to chuck overboard yes. whole areas of traditional discourse, yes. not only in religion and not yes. only in politics, but also in philosophy and no doubt yes. all other areas of life. Now, one query that occurs to one straight away is this. If we make uh, moral judgments yes. or value judgments or aesthetic judgments, it seems pretty clear that these are neither statements about the world, mm -hmm. nor are they tautologies. Yes. Now, that must have been obvious to logical positivists from the start. Mm -hmm. How did they deal with this? Well, it wasn't obvious to them that they weren't statements about the world. Um, there's a quite a long tradition in ethics which makes uh, ethical statements what is called naturalistic, that is, as, uh, statements about what or is not conducive to the satisfaction of human desires or to the furtherance of, of human happiness and so on. And this is the view that, for example, Schlick took. He wrote a book, rather a good book, called Ethical Questions, Fragen der Ethik, in which he put forward the doctrine that what, et what ethics is about is what human beings want and how their wants are to be satisfied, and roughly a form of utilitarianism. This is possible. Now, other people, Carnap, uh, for instance, and also myself, took a different view. We took the view that, that uh, ethical statements were much more like commands. I mean, not true or false, but uh, I, I developed what's called the emotive theory, that the ethical statements were expressions of feeling. Uh, Carnap took the view that they were more like imperatives. So ethics was brought in, in, that, in therefore, in one of two ways, either as in a naturalistic way, as being about what conduces to human happiness, which is then a scientific matter of fact, it deals with matter of psychology and sociology and so on, or being treated as, as not indeed uh, 
metaphysical nonsense, but as being uh, not fact-stating, either imperative or emotive. Now, when they used the verification principle, like a sort of Occam's razor, I mean, slashing about right and left yes. and getting rid of all sorts of uh, things, what difference did this make to the philosophical outlook of the people who were influenced by it? Because it did have an enormous effect and on the way people saw the world and the way they saw philosophy. Well, one effect uh, it had, as one you were mentioned in, in your uh, opening remarks, that it made philosophers very much more self-conscious about what they were doing. I mean, they had to justify their own activity on the assumption that natural sciences took up the field, as it were. You then had to find a place for philosophy. Philosophy wasn't, as it were, allowed to be a competitor with them. And then people became much more self-conscious about what philosophers were about. And on the whole, the um, Vienna Circle wasn't the only influence. There was also the influence of people like G. E. Moore in England, who were defending rather similar views for very different reasons. Moore believed, for instance, for instance that propositions of common sense were certainly true and so on, and, and it could be shown that this could extend also to the, to the sciences, that the, each domain had its own criteria. Through the influence of the circle and through the influence of people like, like Moore, philosophers came to think that their function could be only that of analysis. And then the question arose what analysis was, how it was practiced, what were its methods, what were the criteria, etc., etc. And so, so that, in fact, under this stimulus, the, yeah. the techniques of analysis reached a degree of sophistication right, yes. far greater than they ever reached before. That, is, that, I think, is so. Would it be a not unreasonable simplification to say this, that, that they thought that the job of finding out about the world and describing the world mm -hmm, yes. was the task of science? That's right. So all the various sciences were doing that. Yes. Uh, and therefore, it wasn't the task of philosophy to find out about the world or explain our Yes, well, they, yes, I mean... It, it couldn't, as it were. It, no, there, was, there wasn't any space there for wasn't it any to space occupy. For it. Yes, yes. There, yes. So the task of philosophy, in fact, was to refine the methods of mm. science, to clarify the concepts yes. being used, to clarify the methods of yes. argument being used, and mo perhaps most importantly of all, to separate out the legitimate methods of argument That's available right. to science to the Ill from the illegitimate That's right. method, methods of argument. Um, you could put it uh, in a technical way by saying that philosophy then came to be seen as a second-order subject, the first order being talking about the world, the second order being talking about talking about the world. And I, think, I, think, talk I, think about was, talk. I think I don't know if it's Gilbert Ryle's expression, that philosophy yes. came to be seen as talk about talk. Yes, yes. And now, now we're talking about talk about talk. Yes. Uh, this brings us on to the whole area of language. Yes. Uh, one striking feature of logical positivism mm -hmm. was that it, it brought a wholly new emphasis to bear uh, on the importance of language in philosophy. I have a quotation here from Bertrand Russell from his book, My mm -hmm. Philosophical Development, and it's very striking in this context because he tells about how, he, until he was in his mid-40s, yes. and it's important to remember that by that time he'd done nearly all the work pretty well, which he's now pretty, most pretty, pretty famous, all the important work he'd done, All the yes. important work. He said this, that until that time he, and now I'm quoting, had thought of language as transparent, Mm -hmm. That is to say, as a medium which could be employed without paying attention to it. Now, I should think it's almost certainly true that virtually mm -hmm. all philosophers until this century took a similar view. They didn't actually ex turn in upon themselves and examine the medium of thought and expression, language. They used it unselfconsciously, as if you didn't have to pay attention to it, you could simply uh, use it about the world. Now, the logical positivists took an entirely different approach to language from that, didn't they? Yes, I think this is right. You could say that the interest in language starts very early, even with Socrates, who went around asking his fellow citizens what is justice, what is knowledge, what is, what is uh, perception, and so on, um, what is courage. But he didn't see these, I think, as verbal questions. I think Plato uh, saw them as questions about the nature of abstract entities, which he thought of as, as being real. They weren't seen as verbal questions, although in retrospect one can see them as having been questions about, about meanings, at least. I think that um, it probably does start only um, at the beginning of this century, this extremely um, conscious preoccupation with language. Wittgenstein and Russell, at the beginning of the century, were interested in the relation between language and the world. This was the great problem of Wittgenstein, the problem uh, which the Tractatus was meant to be an answer to. And of course, he ended by saying it couldn't be described, but only, only shown. But the, 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 notion, the intense preoccupation of philosophers with the way that language functions perhaps begins only uh, in quite a late period after, after the last and war. It leads philosophers into a situation where as soon as anyone makes an assertion of any kind about the world, what you then do is examine the assertion. 
and you get straight away into the examination of statements, the analysis of propositions, mm -hmm. uh, an analysis of the relation of the terms of the proposition to each other, its logical form, and yes. so on and so forth. And philosophy soon can soon seem to become on that basis about language. And indeed, it would be true to say, wouldn't it, that a lot of non-philosophers have acquired the view uh, that philosophers are only concerned with language, and sometimes this is put disparagingly, mm. that they're only playing with words. Can you give some explanation of why that sort of prejudice against philosophy, which is very widespread, is misplaced? Well, a great deal of philosophy it certainly is about language in as far as it, as it distinguishes between um, different uh, types of utterance and analyzes certain types of expression. I think the main, I mean, I, I would, would make no apology for this, but beyond that, I think the answer I would give is that the distinction between being about language and being about the world isn't all that sharp, because the world is the world as we describe it. The world is the world as it figures in our system of concepts. And in exploring um, our system of concepts, you are at the same time exploring the world. Let's take an example. Suppose now one is interested in the question of, of causality. Now, uh, with, and we certainly believe that causality is something that happens in the world. I, I, I am bitten by the Anopheles mosquito, I get malaria and so on, one thing causes another. And one could put it by saying, what is causality? And uh, this is perfectly respectable, important, traditional philosophical question. You can also put it by saying, how do we analyze causal statements? What do we mean by saying that one thing causes another? And in fact, although you look as though you're posing a purely linguistic question, you're answering exactly the same question as philosophers have always posed, only putting it in a different form. And we think, or well, uh, most not the philosophy, a rather clearer form. Now, the point is that I think that there was a time, uh, I think the fashion has passed, it happened uh, about tw uh, uh, 20 years ago and, and uh, came to be known as the philosophy of the Oxford School, mainly through the work of a particular philosopher called John Austin, it wasn't universal even then, when philosophers were a bit inclined to, to, to study usage for its own sake, uh, without uh, seeing it as a means of solving any problems. And this, I think, is still alive. That, that did become arid. I did become arid, etc. Yes. But I think mostly now, when people uh, try to investigate the meanings of words, it is because these are concepts they're studying. Yeah which do play an important part in uh, our description of what we think the world is really like. I mean, it, Well, I think that what you've just said really boils down to saying that the investigation of our use of language and our use of concepts is an investigation of the structure of the world, yes, of the world yes. as experienced by human yes, beings. Yes. There's an obvious relationship between what you've just said there and Wittgenstein's and the logical positivist's doctrine that, la that philosophy, the proper task of philosophy, consists not in uh, formulating doctrines, Mm -hmm. about in the activity of analysis, yes, that yes, philosophy ought exactly. to be analysis yes. and uh, the organon of science. Yes, yes. Now, this, it seems to me, had enormous influence on the educated layman. I went up to Oxford as an undergraduate uh, during the years after the war, and people who were not studying philosophy mm. at all seemed to me to have come very much under the influence of some of these doctrines. Uh, in particular, one was if, if one tried to make an assertion of any kind about any subject, nothing yes, to do with philosophy, yes, yes, one was immediately yes, pinned against yes, the wall by people who said to you, how would you go about verifying that yes, statement? Yes, or what exactly do you yes, mean by that? What kind of an answer do you want to that question? Are you you're conscious of, uh, of that having I, been so? I think I was so. I think I was partly responsible for that, <laughs> yes. Now, coming to your responsibility for this, mm -hmm. I think it would be interesting at this stage to come to your connection with the movement. Mm -hmm. You've described who the main people in Vienna yes. were, You've talked about what some yes. of their central doctrines were. Now, you are well known as the figure who introduced these doctrines into England, yes. where they have, I must say, had an enormous influence ever since, right up to and including this day. How did you come to do that? Well, I was uh, up at Oxford in late 20... I, went, I came up in 29, took my schools in 1930, 1932, and I was at Christchurch, pupil of Gilbert Riles, and when I took my schools, I was appointed a lecturer at, at Christchurch and given a few months' leave of absence. And uh, I thought I'd go to Cambridge to study under Wittgenstein, but uh, Gilbert Ryle said, no, don't do that. Uh, go to Vienna instead. He happened to meet Schlick at a congress, I think in, it was in Oxford also, two years before. And he had half an hour's conversation with him and, and thought that he was interesting and got the impression something was going on in Vienna. I think he'd also perhaps read some of the articles they produced. 
So he said to me, why not go to Vienna, find out what's happening there. We know roughly what became slightly changed. We don't know what's happening in Vienna. You come back and uh, go there and find out and tell us. Well, I didn't speak very much German. I spoke hardly any German at that time, but I thought I probably could learn enough just to follow what was going on. And so I went um, with a letter of introduction to Schlick from Gilbert. And, and Schlick, I now see, in reached her, I see this astonishing at the time, seemed to be quite natural, but said, come and join the circle. Uh, and so I did. <laughs> And yeah. uh, the only other foreigner allowed in was uh, Quine, the fa American right. philosopher, the famous American philosopher. We were there together. This was in what? I went, went to Vienna in November 32 and stayed until the spring of 33. And you, you were in your very early 20s. I was in my, yes, I was, 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 no, I was younger than that. I must have been just uh, 23, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. No, 22, I was 22, oh, 22, yeah. just 22. Yeah. And, and um, I sat then, and I, I didn't contribute. My German wasn't good enough, and it was mainly debates between Schlick and Neurath at that time. On and on and on and on the discussion went, and I sat and listened, and then came back to England, very full of all this. I wrote a paper in mine called Demonstration of the Impossibility of Metaphysics, which is simply borrowed from the verification principle. And then Isaiah Berlin uh, said to me, I was, we used to meet regularly and talk philosophy together, he said, you're, you're so full of this, why don't you write a book about it? And I said, why not? And so I sat down and in 18 months wrote Language, Truth and Logic. And it, I wrote it when I was 24, and it was published when I was just 25. Were you astounded by the exposure of consequences? Well, it didn't have all that uh, uh, um, great success at the beginning. It had a succès de scandale. The older philosophers at Oxford were absolutely outraged by it, and in fact, it was very hard for me to get a teaching job at Oxford, and I didn't get one. Before the war, I was a research fellow. Mm. It was only after the war, when it got reprinted, that there's this, that, that was this, it had this enormous success. And got, I suppose already uh, before the war, when it first came out, it did impress the younger people. They were very excited by it. Because they did see this liberation. You see, Oxford philosophy before the war was terribly sterile. There were some old men who were only interested in the history of philosophy, only interested in repeating what Plato had said and, and, and trying to put down anyone and say anything new. And now from logic, with his, did seal with his huge mind put onto these people, did seem to the younger people as a liberation. They did, seem, they did feel they could breathe. And, I, and that way it had a big historical effect. And I'd like to hear you say something about the influence you think it had outside philosophy. It seems to me to have had obvious effects, not only in science and logic and philosophy, but in things like literary criticism or yes. history and so on. It probably had less effect than, than on in, within science than, for example, the work of Karl Popper. His, his, uh, his logical scientific discoveries came out in the German edition in, in about the same time, about a year or so, or so earlier. I think probably appealed more to the scientists themselves. But even so, even with language and logic, the scientists felt that this was all right. I mean, they were told they were, after all, the most important people. That they, they didn't have to. <laughs> they liked that. They didn't yeah. have to worry about the philosophers standing over and said, "Oh, we mustn't say that." Not that they ever had yeah. worried much, but, but yeah. it was nice to be told that, 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 they, that what they were doing was really the, the fundamental thing. But if um, one, take, can I, if one takes not only your book, yes. uh, but but the whole movement, of which mm, your book yes. is about logical positivism, yes. what do you think the influence of that was? Well, I think, it, I think there was a great emphasis on, on clarity and a great opposition to what might be called wooliness. Um, there was a kind of, of uh, injunction to look at the facts, to see things as they are, to be a bit of humbug. All this is very attractive to young people in any field. And it, the, 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 and it went with, I think, a... Um, a general reaction against Victorian hypocrisy, really. This was seen as stripping off. The, I mean, it was the it was the the, uh, the Hans Andersen child, which, as you said in your opening remarks, was functioning everywhere, saying the emperor has no clothes. There he is parading around with these huge robes and so on, and and places bowed out. And the fact the fellow's naked. And this notion, the fellow's naked, which that with lots of parts were taken to be saying, was very exciting for anyone doing any subject. And of course, that that is enough in itself to explain the huge and passionate hostilities that oh, were aroused against indeed, logical yes, positivism. Yes, indeed. Authoritarian governments like the communist yes, and Nazi yes. governments banded all together. Oh, yes, didn't yes, they? Yes, and, uh, yes. Even uh, liberals were were discomforted by just it. a little. Yes, 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 yes. They thought it was too iconoclastic. Yes, yes. But now it must have had actually some real defects. What do you now, in retrospect, think that the main shortcomings of the movement were? Well, I suppose the, most of the defects is that nearly all of it was false. <laughs> <laughs> I think you need to say uh, a little more about that. <laughs> well, I, that's, that's being too harsh on it. I, I think that I, I still want to say that it was true in spirit, in a way, that the attitude was right. Uh, but if one goes for the details, first of all, the verification principle never got itself properly formulated. I, I tried several times, uh, and always it always let in either too uh, too little or, or, or too much. And to this day, it hasn't received that, that properly logically precise uh, formulation. 
then the reductionism just doesn't work. I mean, you, 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 you can't reduce statements. Even sta you can't reduce even sta ordinary simple statements about cigarette cases and glasses and ashtrays to statements about sense data, uh, let alone the more abstract statements of science. So the really exciting strict reductionism of, of Schlick and the early Russell and so on uh, doesn't work. And then you want to think all the wishy-washy, which almost nobody would, would uh, dissent from, that uh, a scientific hypothesis must be have some relation to observation. Uh, I mean, this is all that, 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 that remains there. It seems to me uh, at least very doubtful whether statements of logic and mathematics are, are analytic in any interesting sense. The whole analytic synthetic distinction has been put in question by the work of recent philosophers like, like Quay, and it's no longer, I think so, I still want to maintain it in some form. It's no longer so clear cut as I once thought it was. And um, I'm not sure. In some sense, obviously, statements about mathematics are different from, from uh, uh, statements about uh, the empirical world. But saying, as I, as I said, they're true by convention, I'm not at all sure this is right. Anyhow, it needs a lot of defending. Again, um, the whole, I mean, certainly in language and logic, the reduction of statements about the past to statements about uh, their future ev evidence for them is wrong. My treatment of the minds was wrong. My treatment of ethics, I think, was still on the right lines, though, though, though much to uh, uh, summary. So if you, if you go in detail, very, very little survives. What survives is the sort of general rightness of the approach, I think. The, the, um... Would you agree with, it, with me if I tried to put it this way, that, that looking back on it, what seems to have been enormously uh, good about the achievement of logical positivism is almost entirely negative. That is to say, it did clear away mm -hmm. whole areas right. of yes. hitherto plausible yes. philosophizing, yes. which were now seen under the uh, yes. through through the lenses of That's the new right. logic and the new science yes. not to be acceptable. Mm -hmm. So that whole traditional areas got, so to speak, cleared of lumber. Yes. Uh, but it now looks as if all they actually succeeded in doing was clear the ground, because what they tried to build on that ground that they cleared isn't standing up. Well, it's a little more than this. It was very liberating. I think if we, perhaps we can go back to something said not by a logical positivist, but by a pragmatist, William James. And of course, pragmatism, which came earlier, is in many ways very akin to logical positivism. William James had a phrase in which he, in which he asked for the cash value of statements. And I think this is very important on the positive side. The early positivists went wrong in thinking that we still maintain the gold standard. That, that, that if you took if you said your notes, you could get gold for them, which of course you can't. There isn't enough gold and too many notes. But nevertheless, there must be some backing to the currency. And this, this is, I think, what, what comes out. But if, if someone makes an assertion, all right, perhaps you can't translate it uh, into observational terms, but still, it's important to ask, for clarifying it, how you would set about testing it, what observations were. But this, I think, still holds good so former, and is positive. Former logical positivists like yourself, yes. uh, although you, you, you now say that most of the do detailed doctrine yes, yes, falls, yes. are still immensely influenced by that whole approach oh, yes. and, and are addressing yourself to much the same question, yes, but in yes. a more liberal, open sort of way. I would say this is so, yes. Yeah. yes. Now, uh, I'm a much older man. I do it much sl more, more slowly. Possibly, I, I almost certainly with less brilliance than there wasn't any brilliance before, perhaps more soundly. I hope perhaps I've learned something with the years. Thank you very much, Professor Eyre.